Seamus looks at the clerk and yells out that he's the reason his bank robbery went bust. He pulls out a small pistol, but for once, Molly is faster. As he pulls the trigger, she grabs onto the clerk, and the bullet hits her in the ribs. What's up everybody, Jeff here, and we're back to break down all the lore for another Malifaux Master. This week, we're talking about Molly from The Resurrectionists. So spoilers coming up for all of Molly's stories, and you can find a list of the sources in the description, including the episode of the Breachside broadcast, so you can check out the stories for yourself or listen to them if you prefer it that way. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, join the Discord, and if you want to support the channel and get some cool rewards, then check out the Patreon as well. All that will be linked below. But now, let's talk about Molly. Molly is at a museum, and as she prepares to take a picture of the Gorgon's Tear, the curator explains to her the history of the cursed gem. It seems that anyone who came in possession of the gem had come to an untimely death. As Molly snaps her picture, she thinks she sees a figure standing behind the gem, but when she looks again, she only sees a woman in a dress, carrying a parasol. Something doesn't look right, and as the curator asks the woman to leave, she turns and reveals that she's undead. Several other rotten bells emerge and attack the curator, and as Molly goes to run away, she's caught by Seamus, who tells her not to worry, because the bells always leave the pretty ones for him. He stabs her through the back with a knife, and then bends down and kisses her. He then hears the bootfalls of the death marshals coming, and is surprised that they know about his presence. He tells Molly that he'll be back for her, and then takes the Gorgon's tear and Molly's camera as a souvenir, and then leaves. At Molly's funeral, a man is making a speech about her excellent reporting as Seamus' bells attack the guards. Seamus jumps on top of the casket as the funeral goers panic, and he asks them not to leave as he'd like to say a few words. He makes a lewd comment about how he didn't know Molly well, but he wished he knew her better, as he tears open the casket and stabs her in the stomach with a sword that has the Gorgon's tear attached. She suddenly takes a breath, and he holds up a picture that he found in her camera, showing the Gorgon's tear with the faint image of a woman with snakes for hair behind it. He asks Molly if she knows who this woman is, and Molly coughs, and then responds that she has seen her in the darkness before. Seamus tells her that she's coming with him, as he picks her body up out of the casket. Seamus brings Molly, as well as a new army of undead that he got from Madame Sabelle's, to a graveyard on the outskirts of the city. He orders his bells to start exhuming the corpse of Philip Toomers, and looks around as he notices that it's starting to snow, and he comments that this is unusual for July. Molly responds, it's December, and the bells pull up the casket to reveal the recently deceased body, as the snow intensifies, covering the entire graveyard. One of the snowbanks moves, and an ice golem emerges, so Seamus draws his pistol and fires at it. Then several ice gaemen emerge, and his bells engage them, but there's too many, and he starts to pull back to try to escape. Suddenly, a woman in a cloak appears, and demands that Seamus leave the body and go, but Seamus refuses and responds by shooting at her. As the golem, who wasn't really dead, grabs Philip's body, and it and Sabelle engage in a tug-of-war, which results in the body tearing in half and its head popping off. The struggle causes Molly to fall, and she lands in the open grave and gets buried by snow. Seamus races to recover Philip's head, and Rasputina seems to do the same, but then Seamus realizes that she's going for his body, and she recovers a small journal from his pocket. She disappears, and she Seamus considers himself victorious, as he takes the head and recovers Madame Sabelle before leaving, forgetting all about Molly, and she is soon found by the guild. McMorning and the judge stand in the morgue, looking over Molly's body. The judge asks how long she's been dead for, and McMorning tells him he must be trying to trick him, as everyone knows that Molly died over a month ago, and it was reported widely in the papers. The judge tells him he has no patience for his antics, and asks how much decomposition the body shows. McMorning explains that if he didn't already know she died a month earlier, he would be forced to conclude that she had just died recently. He explains that the body shows no decomposition, and comments that as soon as he saw her, he knew she was one of Seamus' girls, as the man does have a particular taste. The judge scolds him again, telling him to save his aesthetic opinion, and only give his professional. McMorning explains that whatever method was used to reanimate her, must have taken a lot of energy to maintain the body in this state. The judge tells him that he better make himself scarce, as the lady is coming, and she is much less indulgent of eccentricities. McMorning walks off, muttering under his breath, and comments that Lady Justice needs to get a sense of humor, as the the old severed hand prank is a classic. After McMorning leaves, the judge looks over the body and examines the file about Molly's death. Soon, Lady Justice joins him, and she asks for a report on what happened in the graveyard. The judge explains that Seamus must have been elated at whatever he found, as he left Molly behind, and she's one of his most sophisticated reanimations to date. Lady Justice agrees, and mentions Philip's severed head, before adding that their priority needs to be recovering the Gorgon's tear. The judge tells her that according to Sonia Crid, the Gorgon's Tear might be a conduit which allows immaterial beings to communicate in the physical world. Justice says that it doesn't matter, and they need to stop Seamus, and she tells the judge to use Molly's body as bait, as Seamus will want her back. 
She considers to herself that Molly was a good person in life and that she didn't deserve this. She reaches out to touch the woman's hand and is horrified when the hand falls away. She soon realizes that the hand is not Molly's at all and tells the judge that if he sees McMorning, he should break something. Seamus is in the streets in the quarantine zone, tending to a machine, as McMorning and his assistant Sebastian approach. Seamus knows that Molly's body was taken by the guild, and would therefore be in McMorning's morgue, and he asks the man for help getting her back. McMorning asks Seamus what's in it for him, and Seamus pulls Philip's head out of a bag and hooks it up to the machine. Suddenly a blinding flash of light erupts as electricity shoots through the head, and McMorning complains, but Seamus interrupts him and greets Philip who looks up at them, asking if he's alive. Seamus introduces him to everyone, referring to Sebastian as McMorning's monkey, and Philip responds by screaming. Seamus stuffs the head back into the bag, and then explains to McMorning that he needs him to return to the morgue and reanimate Molly's body, and help her escape while Seamus causes a distraction. He hands the man a small package that contains the Gorgon's tear, and explains that it will reanimate Molly, and that in exchange, McMorning can keep the machine. McMorning agrees, and Seamus tells him that he'll try not to blow up the morgue in the explosion. An explosion makes the morgue shake as Seamus begins his attack. McMorning tells Sebastian to be careful with the Gorgon's tear as the assistant approaches Molly's body. She suddenly coughs, spewing blood out of her mouth, and Sebastian accidentally drops the tear on her chest. Molly sits up, grabbing the orb, and calls out to Seamus. McMorning tells her that he's going to bring her to him. Outside, they heave Molly over a horse, as the reanimation process has made it hard for her to balance. As they begin to ride away to meet Seamus, a guild guard approaches, telling McMorning he must stop, as no one's allowed to leave the scene of the battle until everyone's been interviewed. McMorning draws his shotgun and shoots the man in the chest. After recovering Molly, Seamus sets out for the bayou by boarding a train to Ridley Station. The train is full of miners returning from work, and he takes the opportunity to turn all of the miners in his car into zombies under his control. When they arrive at the station, the other passengers leave their cars, and Seamus hears the judge call out for him to surrender. He sends his minions flooding out onto the platform, and they attack the death marshals. The judge is dispatching several of the zombies before Seamus steps out of the train and shoots him directly in the chest. He turns to see Rasputina standing at the other end of the station, and the woman recognizes him from their last encounter. She raises a hand to shoot ice at him, but he lifts a weapon that looks like a flamethrower with the Gorgon's tear mounted at the tip and shoots green flame that counters the ice. The battle continues and Seamus' new weapon is damaged, but he recovers the Gorgon's tear, giving it to Molly. Soon Lady Justice arrives and Rasputina almost gets the better of Seamus before Sonya Crit attacks her and she tries to retreat. Lady Justice and the marshals move in on Seamus, who's running out of tricks, and he hears Rasputina cry out in pain as the judge, who's still alive, surprised her and catches her in a bear trap. The marshals lay down covering fire as Lady Justice approaches, and before Seamus can react, she's standing above him. She thrusts her sword through his shoulder, pinning him to the ground, and soon Sonia and Samael join her, carrying Philip's journal that they recovered from Rasputina. Samael tells them that Rasputina was headed to Kythera, and asks if Seamus was headed there as well. Seamus responds that he has a summer home there, and then Lady Justice and Sonia argue over whether they should head to Kythera to investigate, or return to the Enclave with the prisoners. Then Molly speaks up, and explains that the women might be interested in Kythera, because they could use its power to banish undeath from the world, ending necromancy and stopping Molly's suffering as an undead. Lady Justice declares that they will head for Kythera and orders that the three prisoners be put in manacles. Using Philip's guidance, Sonia and Lady J bring the group to the ruins of Kythera, hidden away in the bayou. Seamus whispers to Rasputina, telling her that there's no hard feelings, and that they should cooperate as they seem to be after the same thing. Rasputina promptly refuses, telling Seamus that he doesn't understand what it is that she's after. When they arrive, Sonia brings Rasputina deeper into the ruins to a pedestal overlooking the water, and Seamus looks on as Rasputina is told to speak the words that should close Kythera. As she does so, Seamus yells out to her, demanding to know why she would want to close it, and telling her that he will kill her. The large arms that make up the structure begin to close as a storm forms, and a gust of wind shoots down on Rasputina, breaking her manacles and throwing several of the guild guards near her. Suddenly, the tyrant known as December manifests himself in the form of a large giant and begins attacking the the guild guards. Sonya tries to stop him, but he easily bats her away, and then Lady Justice attacks as well, but she succumbs to the same fate. Then a woman appears, wielding two katanas, and she attacks him, though her blades seem to have no effect, and December picks her up and squeezes her in his grip. Then another woman, who looks just the same, jumps down from a platform above and plunges onto December with her sword, passing all the way through his body until she lands on the ground. This magical blade doing him in, December collapses, and the two mysterious women disappear as the guild members regroup and try to tend to their wounds. Meanwhile, Seamus takes this 
this opportunity to overpower the two men guarding him, and he recovers the Gorgon's tear, and the tyrant, the Gorgon herself, tells him the words he needs to reopen Kythera, and he speaks them aloud. Sonya and Lady Justice are too late when they notice him, and the ruins of Kythera begin opening again. The ground shakes as a maelstrom forms in the water, and a portal opens as black tentacles begin reaching up out of the water, grasping onto the ruins as something tries to make its way into this world. Seamus is gleeful as he looks on, realizing that the grave spirit, the embodiment of death itself, will bring on the end of this world, and that thought makes him blissfully happy. As more tentacles emerge, they suddenly hear explosions as a huge metal construct approaches, firing its many cannons at the creature and the portal. The monster doesn't seem to be phased by this assault, but the ruins themselves take significant damage, and the portal and the maelstrom collapse before the grave spirit can fully manifest. In the aftermath of the incident at Kythera, Zoraida, Pandora, and Lilith gather around a cauldron and discuss how everything went according to their plan, for the most part. Zoraida mentions that the Gorgon had escaped her notice, and that everything almost went awry because of her presence. They look into the magical cauldron and watch as Seamus and Molly, as well as Philip's head, make their way out of the swamp, and Molly is wearing the Gorgon steer around her neck. Molly is bound to Seamus, as he's the one who resurrected her, but this is opposed by an equal amount of revulsion for the man. She can barely remember her time of being alive, but can recall her death, and the rough way she was brought back from the afterlife that came with horrible bouts of bloody coughing. Her second resurrection was much gentler, as it was facilitated by the Gorgon's Tear, and Seamus now thinks that she has a connection to the mysterious gem. Now, Molly serves as a glorified porter, carrying around the head of Philip Toomers, as Seamus hopes that he'll be able to provide some useful information. More recently, Molly has been exhibiting a strange fondness for the more unusual undead creatures that they come across, and while Seamus hopes to use this to his advantage, Molly finds her gift to be a source of freedom. Seamus and Molly are in a cave, as the man tries to do more research on the world of ancient Malifaux to try to gain access to its secrets. Molly has a coughing fit, and Seamus asks her to quiet down, and then the woman replies that something's happening, the gate is open. Seamus tells her to pipe down as he doesn't have time for her rambling, and Molly looks out the cave entrance and sees a red comet fly across the sky. She decides not to say anything, because Seamus would be aware of it soon enough. Seamus returns to a hideout with Molly and one of his bells, and the bell hands him several envelopes. Seamus expects that these are fan letters from people throughout the city who are fascinated by his work. He looks through the letters and realizes that they're from a real estate agent with the layouts of buildings and information. He starts sifting through them, and Molly picks one out of the stack and tells him to pick this one. When she is insistent, Seamus concedes and tells her to go check out the building and let him know if she finds anything interesting. Molly and Philip go to meet with the real estate agent, and the woman doesn't seem to be bothered by Philip's appearance. She warns them that the building is reported to be haunted, and then introduces them to two people who will also be looking at the building. The other two enter, and then Molly walks in, pushing Philip in his pram. He says that he senses unquiet spirits, and Molly agrees, but is distracted by the fact that she feels like she knows this building. She goes to the main entrance and finds a brass plaque that reads Octavius Hall. Philip asks her if she's feeling okay, and she tells him that she's feeling angry. As they head towards the basement, Molly remembers an article she had written about a shady businessman who had tried to buy Octavia Hall and likely wanted to kick out its elderly residents. She had organized a protest and forced the man to back down. In the basement, they find the body of the woman who was also looking at the property. Molly had written another article about how the 41 residents of Octavia Hall were being evacuated to rest homes earthside due to noxious vapors that were coming from the sewers. There were rumors of unauthorized underground work, but they had all been dismissed. She examines the body, concluding that the woman is dead, and then leaves Philip over his protesting and goes further into the basement. She finds a dirty room full of broken glass that has a pile of canvas sacks. When she looks closer, she finds that each sack has a body inside that's long dead. She counts them, and there's 41. No rest home Earthside had a record of receiving the 41 patients. When Molly died, she had been in the middle of investigating one of her biggest stories. She had let them down. She then hears a noise and turns to see that her way out is blocked by what looks like an assemblage of the scraps that are laying on the floor. The machine gets ready to pounce, but Molly calls out, Here boy. It jumps forward and grabs onto her legs, and Molly pats it on the head and calls it a good boy. She closes her eyes and sees its experiences through the centuries, having been stored in this room, and then seeing men come in and breaking its container. As she opens her eyes, she realizes that the machine was the reason the building was abandoned, but it was not responsible for these bodies. As she walks out, the machine follows her. When they get back upstairs, the other man, who was viewing the property, is standing there waiting and pulls out a gun and shoots the machine. 
He asks her what the hell it was, but Molly just keeps walking directly towards him. He motions to the Gorgon's tear around her neck and tells her that she and it are going to be coming with him and then points his gun at her face and tells her that's far enough. She reaches for the Gorgon's tear and holds it up, intending to show the man what truly lies inside of it. He was on his knees frothing at the mouth for more than a minute before he managed to start screaming. Molly waits until he stops before dispatching him. When Philip asks what the machine is, Molly reaches out with a bit of her energy and causes it to stand back up and it quickly starts running circles around her excitedly. Molly has a memory of a childhood dog and replies to Philip, Ponto. They then seek out the real estate agent and Molly demands to know who the owner of the building is. The woman says that she can be if she pays the price, but Molly tells her that she will only ask once. The woman replies that they shouldn't fight as it wouldn't profit either of them, but she can't give up the identity of her client. Molly tells her that she'll pay then and puts down a bag of soul stones, but adds that she will only do it in person and that there's a little extra there for her to make sure they come alone. The woman smiles. He did not come alone and Molly was not surprised. The unscrupulous businessman from her article was exactly who she expected and he came with three bodyguards and a lawyer. He never saw it coming as Molly throws Philip's head and it smacks into the man's head causing him to crumple to the ground. The lawyer panics and runs away as the necrotic machine falls on the bodyguards, syringes bared. The man awakens to find himself on the top of a pile of sacks. Molly and Ponto look on as Philip asks the man if it's fair to say that he purchased the hall in secret and then killed off the elderly residents so that he could dig in the basement for relics. The man notices the sacks he's on have started to squirm and he lets out a cry. Philip says he'll take that as a yes and then asks if it's true that he stumbled on the necrotic machine in the basement and abandoned the place in terror and then made up the story about emanations from the sewers. Some of the sacks start wriggling towards the man and he begs them to help. A hand of bones shoots out of one of them and grabs onto his leg as Philip says it seems like another yes and then asks the man if he'd like to be saved from his former customers. He shakes his head vigorously and Molly makes a motion and Ponto approaches the man with a piece of paper. Philip tells him to sign it. As the sacks continue to swarm the man, he frantically signs the paper and then Ponto picks him up away from the grasping hands. It then injects him with a syringe and as the man tries to protest, Ponto and Molly seal him in a large glass container. The concoction he was injected with would keep him alive for centuries even after the air in the jar had run out. As they leave, Molly tells Ponto to seal up the room and bring the roof down behind them. Out on the street, Molly folds up the signed confession and puts it in an envelope addressed to the editor of the Malifaux Daily Record. As Ponto rejoins them, Molly scratches its head and tells it it's a good boy. Philip tells her that he doesn't think it's a boy and Molly thinks about it for a minute and then rips off a piece of the pram's hood and bends down. When she stands back up, Ponto has a pink ribbon with a bow. Molly walks through the quarantine zone holding Philip as the wind blows frozen sleet against her bare skin. Philip asks her if it's cold and she tells him no and he considers asking why they're in the quarantine zone but decides that Molly might put him back in his sack if he gets too chatty. As they walk further, they start to find rubble and broken stone and wood covering several blocks. They recognize what used to be a guild guard post that shows signs of fire and Molly tells Philip that plague lived here. She explains that the guild burnt it down to stop the disease from spreading. Philip tells her that he overheard Nicodem telling Seamus that the plague mob attacked his observatory. He asks her why. Molly doesn't respond, but slowly turns until they're both facing a massive pile of bodies. Molly explains that when the plague was spreading, people were dying too fast for the cemeteries to handle all the bodies. They decided to come to the quarantine zone and dig a hole and simply stack all the bodies up. Philip asks her why they're here and Molly tells him that Nicodem or the others might come here to add the bodies to their army. She asks him if he thinks it can be stopped. Molly and Seamus stand in front of the plague pit in the quarantine zone. Three of his bells are wearing guild guard uniforms and he tries to convince Molly to record the upcoming events, though she seems to be reluctant. He tells one of the bells that Samuel Hopkins is looking for him and that she is to go lead him to Seamus. As she walks away, Seamus senses the power from the event, similar to that from a soul stone, but far more powerful. He taps into the power and reaches out towards the grave spirit, a being thought only to be accessible at a place like Kythera, but Seamus's research had revealed that any place that is infused with many lingering spirits may provide access to the grave spirit's power. As he senses this connection, the bell returns with Hopkins close behind. He fires at one of the bells, killing it, and hits the other one with a glancing blow, but his magically infused bullets light her on fire, and she burns. Seamus tells him to give him a minute as he's in the middle of something. As the power of the grave spirit spills over him, and his body starts starts to transform. He sees Samael trying to resist as the grave spirit tries to make him insane, and he only stops himself from fleeing by shackling his wrist to a nearby fence. He manages to lift his gun and fires, hitting Seamus in the chest.
exist, but as his body transforms, he barely seems to be affected. As he grows larger, black inky tendrils project from his body as the grave spirit tries to take him over, and he tells Hopkins to shoot him again if he can. Hopkins manages to lift the gun again and fires as one of the tendrils moves towards Seamus's head, ready to take him over, but the bullet meets its mark first, piercing through Seamus's forehead and out the back. The tendrils disappear and his body falls to the pavement, lifeless. Molly takes the Gorgon's tear and presses it against the wound in Seamus' forehead. The stone sinks into the wound and the flesh heals itself around it as Seamus opens his eyes. He looks around confused and then asks Molly what she's done, turning to see Philip's head on the ground and accuses him of giving Molly the idea. He exclaims that he doesn't have enough room in his head for himself, the grave spirit, and the Gorgon. And then he notices that Hopkins is regaining consciousness. He walks towards the man who lifts his gun and fires, hitting Seamus' hat and causing it to fly away. He tries to fire again, but the gun is empty. Seamus asks him how it is that he missed a target so close who did nothing to try to get out of the way, especially a man with a reputation as a sharpshooter such as himself. Hopkins insists that Seamus must have used a soul stone to avoid the bullet, and Seamus points out that Hopkins didn't see any wispy energy that would indicate a soul stone's use. Seamus turns to pick up his hat and then walk away, and Hopkins, who expected to be killed any second, is confused, asking if that's it. Without stopping, Seamus replies that Hopkins and Crid must not have learned anything in spite of all the clues that Seamus left for them. Molly then approaches Hopkins and tells him that the tyrants cannot be defeated. Philip starts to elaborate and begins babbling before Molly stuffs him back into his sack. Molly then clarifies that the vessel must die. Without the vessel, the tyrant has no means of ascension. Hopkins tells her that they'll just find another, and Molly agrees, but says that they'll have wasted so much of their energy that it might be years, possibly centuries, before they would be a threat again. A few of the tyrants have made a play at power, and failed, but the rest are stirring as well. She adds that Crit is near, beneath the city, in the long tunnels created by the ancient people. Hopkins asks if she's alive, and how he can find her, and Molly tells him she's in the necropolis. Molly stands in an alleyway with Philip and laments the fact that she's starting to lose her memories of her life. She watches people going about their business, and Philip comments that he used to love chestnuts. Molly considers going to steal him some, but decides not to as she doesn't feel like cleaning partially digested nuts out of his bag at the end of the day. He then asks her if Seamus didn't tell her to meet him at the library, and Molly says yes, and feels the strong compulsion to go, but it's countered by a stronger impulse that had been growing in her more recently. She had always hated Seamus, but she used to find it impossible to disobey him. Philip asks her if she doesn't think she should go, and she stands up and walks to the end of the alley. The library is to the east. She turns west. Molly stands outside a shipping company office building and watches an employee go about his work. It's mundane and normal, and she's drawn to the fact that he's so devoted, but considers that he probably makes a pittance. Both of these things she identified with before her death. She starts to daydream about what it would be like to spend the day with him, and wonders what color his eyes are. She's soon interrupted by Philip, asking where they are from inside his bag. Molly tells him to go back to sleep. Later, Philip warns that Seamus will not be happy, and Molly says good, and maybe he will stop taking her for granted if she doesn't come at his every whistle. Philip tells her that he's her master, but Molly doesn't respond. That used to be true. When Seamus had raised her, she couldn't say no to him, but now she feels freer. The second time she was risen, he didn't do it. The Gorgon's tear did. She used to stay with him partially out of loyalty, but now her confidence has grown, and she realizes she doesn't need him, he needs her. As they sit in front of the building, Philip drones on, and Molly considers leaving him and moving out of earshot, but fears that he'll be found by the dock workers. She keeps watching the man and trying to figure out what he's writing. She considers how dedicated he is to his work, and wonders if he were to find something new and distracting, if he would pour all of his attention into that. As Philip drones on, she decides that she hopes the man has blue eyes. As it gets dark, the clerk wraps up his work and prepares to leave. Molly gets a better hiding spot to avoid detection, and the man walks outside and starts heading down the street. She considers speaking to him, but knows that a relationship proposal would be absurd, considering that she's undead. Suddenly the man hesitates, and then stops and turns around, and walks directly towards Molly. He asks her why she's always watching. Molly doesn't respond, and he tells her that he sees her watching, sometimes for the whole day. And then he asks if they know each other. They're suddenly interrupted by Seamus yelling that he's been looking for her all day, and that she's been hanging out by the river, and wonders if she's been fishing. Molly could tell that he's pissed, but she turns and says hi. Seamus looks at the man and says fishing isn't Molly's strong suit, and she should probably throw this one back. She asks what he wants, and he laughs, and says that he and his bells were getting shot up by the guild all day, and that she might remember their appointment by the library if she weren't so busy. Molly says she remembered, but that she's not his to command anymore. She can tell that he is seething, and she senses movement as a group of bells approach. She tells him that she was his once, but he let her die, and he didn't bring her back, as she points to the bullet hole in his head. Seamus says she is his and always will be, but she disagrees, and points out that she answers to the power of the Gorgon's tear now, just like he does. 
He snaps and reaches up to wrap his hands around her throat, but suddenly his face contorts with pain and his eyes glow greener. Molly says that's what she meant, and Seamus asks her if she thinks that's the only way he has to kill her, as there's plenty of others who will do it for him. Molly looks at the Bells, all his creations, but she has a theory about that too. She tells him she doesn't think they'll do it, as they like her better than him. He orders them to attack, but they all stand still. He tries again to no avail, and then turns to scold them. Molly is relieved that her bluff worked. She couldn't have been sure, but she knows that she has a connection with the undead, and the more tragic they are, the stronger the bond. The clerk says that he'll be off now, and Seamus and Molly are both surprised, having forgotten that he was standing there. Seamus looks at the clerk and yells out that he's the reason his bank job went bust. He pulls out a small pistol, but Molly is faster. As he pulls the trigger, she grabs the clerk and the bullet hits her in the ribs. She can't make the bells turn on him, but she might be able to trick them. She calls out to the group that Seamus isn't safe here and that they need to take him somewhere else. They all grab him and start pulling him away as Seamus curses. The clerk tells Molly that she's been shot. The hole in her dress is of no concern to her. When the gun went off, it briefly lit up the street so she could see. The clerk had blue eyes. Molly stands in the carving room with Sebastian and knocks on the door to the morgue. McMorning cracks the door and tells her to go away, as she has Guild inside, who are trying to identify the body of a guard who died in an Arcanist attack. Sebastian asks Molly for help holding a body as he carves it up, and she obliges as she thinks about how Seamus was resurrected with the Gorgon's Tear, and now that she no longer has it, she's worried that she'll turn into a normal undead and lose control of herself. Through the crack in the door, she sees someone bent over a body on a table, and they cry out in grief. She then turns to Sebastian and asks him to tell his boss that she needs to borrow some of his friends. Molly thinks about how she hasn't seen Seamus in two months since the incident. They had been looking for new blood in the quarantine zone when they found a girl who was selling flowers. Molly figured that they were really doing her a favor by killing her, and after Seamus shot her, he seemed to be overtaken in a trance. He started speaking in words she didn't understand, and when she tried to rouse him, as she heard people approaching, he didn't respond. Molly grabbed his gun and took cover as some guild guards approached and they took Seamus in. Sebastian tells her that he will and before she leaves he reminds her to take her head. Philip tries to say something but Molly presses him against her chest and no one is able to hear. Molly leaves and goes to help break Seamus out of the sanitarium. Molly walks through the sewers with two bells, a disfigured three-headed dog of McMorning's, and Ponto. She tells the bells to stop, doing a poor imitation of Seamus' accent, and then climbs a ladder to a manhole. She pulls out Philip's head, and they both try to peek out the manhole to figure out if they're in the right place. Suddenly she falls, and they both land on the ground, and Philip confirms that they're right outside. Inside the sanitarium, Seamus had killed two of the guards and turned one into an undead as he tried to make his escape. When he gets to the entrance, he bumps into Molly and her retinue and sees a room full of dead guards. He looks at the dog and asks her why she would have brought that here, and Molly replies that she thought it might like to go for a walk. She pulls out his pistol, and he takes it and shoots one of the guards that are still alive, and then smiles. Molly's career in journalism had made her a household name in Malifaux before she was killed. Now, the unusual circumstances under which she was resurrected allow her to retain some of her personality and freedom that are not common for the undead. This has made her a symbol for those undead who retain some of their will and are feared by humanity and rejected by their creators. In the shadows, the Gorgon watches and waits. Her unusual resurrection was no accident. Molly feels a bit down as she looks at the parade of misfit undead that follow her. They always keep their distance as if they're nervous to approach her and she feels sympathy for them but is also alarmed at the fact that they seem to feel she's in the same boat as they are. What's worse is Philip hadn't spoken to her in three days. She had knitted him a hat with a stuffed body hanging off of it, and Philip had balked when she showed it to him. She insisted he put it on as she had worked hard on it, and after all, he was just ahead, so the most he could do to resist was to complain. She thought it looked cute, but he was mortified and had refused to speak to her ever since, even after she took it off and threw it away. As she tried once again to cheer him up, a thin woman entered the alley and then disappeared. Then three men followed her and Molly sensed danger and began heading in their direction. She hears a scream and starts to run, and when she turns the corner, she sees not three men attacking the girl, but two men being torn apart in a whirlwind of teeth and claws. The third man, running for his life, heads directly for Molly, and one of her followers, a giant flesh construct, smashes him into the wall. Blood splashes into the pram, and Philip breaks its silence to complain. As the whirling spirits dissipate, the girl becomes visible again, and is surrounded by body parts and gore. Molly notices that it was a dead end. It had been an ambush, but the men had made the mistake of thinking that they were the predators. The girl approaches and stops in front of Molly, who says hi, and asks if she is okay, before realizing it's a silly question. The girl responds in Japanese, and Molly is concerned that she may not speak any English. The girl looks into the pram, and doesn't seem alarmed at Philip's appearance, as the disembodied head greets her. She then looks over the hulking form of the flesh construct, before turning back to Molly and telling her she likes her friends. 
The two women walk together, at first only exchanging pleasantries, but soon their conversation becomes a torrent. They talk about Philip and Seamus, and Karai is sympathetic towards Molly's tragic story. After just listening for a long time, Karai finally tells Molly about the love she had lost. She finishes by saying that they say it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, but they lie. Molly says she has to be going, and asks if they can meet again later, and Karai says she would like that. They meet that night and walk around the city chatting. Eventually, they happen upon a man and a woman arguing, as the man tries to force a small child to work as a chimney sweep. The woman insists that it isn't safe, but the man doesn't listen, so Molly tells him that he should leave the girl alone. The man laughs and tries to shoot back a nasty reply, but he's quickly grabbed by the head by the flesh construct. Molly had decided to call him Archie. He looked like an Archie. She then thanks Archie, and the monster carries the man into the house, as Molly pats the girl and tells her she doesn't need to worry about chimneys anymore. As they hear crunching sounds from inside, she adds, except maybe her own. As Archie walks back out, the woman stares in horror. Karai and Molly go on a vigilante tear through the city, focusing their efforts on criminals, especially pimps. At one point, Karai is about to kill a violent pimp when he decides to offer up the name of a man named Gart Ward, who runs a massive prostitution ring out of the Grey Lord. Karai and Molly hang out in an alley as Karai sharpens her shears. They wanted to go direct to the Grey Lord, but Karai had been told that the pimps had a small army and the guild might be on their payroll, possibly even the Governor General. Soon, a group of men approach with practiced casualness. Karai does not respond. As they greet the women, their leader appearing to be much well off than the others who look like hired thugs. He introduces himself as Eli Ward, and Molly considers that it might be a brother or a son. Molly asks what they're doing here, and he says he's here to protect a business interest. His shipments pass through here, and he wants to make sure they don't get disturbed. He suggests that he can pay them to make sure the shipments pass safely. And Mr. Ward, who is very influential, would appreciate it. Karai turns and says she's heard of Gart Ward, another pimp. Eli is offended, but Karai says he made a mistake coming here, and none of them will leave alive. Eli scoffs and tells his men to try not to damage her face, as she will be a big earner for him. One of them asks about Molly, and he says she's pretty, but a bit pale. But bring her too anyway. Molly says thank you, and tells him that he can buy her a drink if he survives. Moments later, Karai piles up the heads of all the men, and puts Eli's head on top. Molly comments that it's a pity, as she rather liked that one. They knew that it was only a matter of time before the other pimps and maybe the guild came for them, which was not a winning proposition. That's why they were now standing across the street from the Grey Lord. They sneak around back and find a metal door that is locked. Molly calls for Archie and asks him to handle it quietly. He pushes against the door to no avail and then turns to Molly with a shrug. She concedes to do it noisily then, and he slams into the door and it bursts open. The two women fight their way through the casino floor, killing employees and patrons alike. They only spare the women, and as reinforcements come down from upstairs, they are easily beaten back by a flood of undead and spirits assaulting them. Eventually, they find the door to Gart's office and burst inside. Molly greets the man who looks terrified and confused. He tells them to spare him the monologue, as he knows what they're here for, but that he has connections and the ward legacy will live on. Molly applauds sarcastically and asks if he means his son Eli. Karai takes out a bag and then throws the head of his son at his feet. Molly tells him that she wants him to know she isn't normally this cruel. She believes in live and let live, and always tries to look on the bright side, but there's no positive side to him, and she can't allow herself any compassion tonight. The man starts sobbing and slumps to his knees to touch his son's face. He tells him to get it over with quickly, and as Karai approaches, Molly tells him that this is too good a job to rush. As they meet back at the riverfront, Molly finds it hard to believe that someone who behaved in such a cruel and heartless way could show such affection for his son. She decides not to dwell on it, as she's too tired, and even worse, Philip still isn't talking to her. She suggests to Karai that they lay low for a while in case the guild tries to come down on them, and tells her that she can come stay with them if she wants. Philip pleads with her to agree, since he needs protection from this crocheting maniac. Molly tells him he looked like a gentleman in the outfit, and Philip asks Karai to tell Molly that if she had any talent, she would realize he looked terrible. Molly ignores him and tells Karai she really would be welcome to come with them. Karai pauses, and then a tiny mischievous smile appears on her face, as she tells him that she knows how to sew. Molly's face lights up, and she suggests that they could make him a little sailor suit. As they walk away, Philip's cry echoes through the streets. Molly found it difficult to care too much about the Governor General's death. Plus, she was preoccupied with her own troubles, as her only living friend, Karai, was spiraling to a deep depression. In addition, Seamus kept showing up to try to take her back, and Philip was recently stolen from his nanny by people from the Guild. The only upside was that Molly had gotten used to bad things happening. She was mostly concerned for Philip, as Seamus was always in annoyance, and Karai had starting work with a necromantic cabal that were trying to raise an army of ghosts. She worried about what sort of things the death marshals would be doing, and as Philip was just ahead, he couldn't care for himself. 
Molly decided to infiltrate the guild, and its weakest link was the Malifaux Tattler. She disguised herself as a freelance reporter and was surprised when the new editor-in-chief, Nellie Cochran, hired her on the spot. She kept to herself, relying on perfume and makeup to conceal her condition, and worked undercover to try to figure out where they were holding Philip. She uses a fake name on her byline, but she found a great deal of pleasure in working again and started to consider staying on after she rescues Philip. Molly and Archie are walking through the industrial zone trying to find some ice cream. They overhear a guild guard talking about a disembodied head that can talk that the death marshals are holding. As one guard walks away, Molly approaches the other. He's startled, but settles down when he sees her. She asks him about Philip, and when he says he doesn't know him, she says he's the one he was just talking about. As she gets closer, he tells her to stop where she is, and Molly says there's no reason to be afraid of us. The man asks who us is, as Archie steps out from the shadows. He shoots Molly, and she feels a new hole in her dress. The guard is surprised and says she should be dead, and Molly clarifies that she is undead. He shoots again, and she tells him he will have to buy her a new dress, as the man starts babbling, and Molly tells him that she just had a question and was gonna let him go, but now, and she motions for Archie. Archie grabs the man by the throat, choking him, and she tells him that she has a few questions, and then explains that she knitted Philip a hat and wants to know where she could find him. The man asks who Philip is through painful cries, and she says he's the disembodied head that the guild has. He tells her that he's at the guild enclave, but Molly knows a lie when she hears it. She motions for Archie again, and he picks the man up by the throat. Just as he's about to pass out, Archie drops him and he falls to his knees. She tells him that they can be friends, best friends, but a friendship can't be built on lies. He tells her that he can't say, as no one is supposed to know, but Molly assures him that it'll be their secret. He still refuses, so she leans in and tells him that if he doesn't say, she'll tell Archie he's full of ice cream, and the only way to get it out is to squeeze it out, and Archie loves ice cream. The man stammers out that the guild is holding him in an unmarked building near the enclave and provides the address. She tells him that it wasn't so hard and explains that she can let him go, but he has to promise not to say anything. She then pulls his mouth open and cuts out his tongue and stuffs a rag in his mouth. As the man struggles, she tells him not to make her have to take his fingers too, and he settles down, so she pats his head. Molly types on a typewriter as she discusses how they can't just waltz into the guild building as part of Operation Free Philip. Archie looks at her hopefully, and she tells him that they can go for ice cream after to celebrate. She explains that they'll need a distraction as she thinks of some of the posters she's seen around the city that seem to distract the people. She exclaims that she's going to need a new pseudonym as Miss Polly Tortolin is more of an editorial gal, and she starts typing. Molly sneaks up to the door of the Malifaux Tattler, holding an article that reads, March for McMorning, devised by deceased. She slides the article under the door and then knocks, before slinking away into the shadows. She sees Nellie Cochran open the door and pick up the envelope. The woman scans the article and then turns back and heads inside. Molly tells Archie that she will definitely run the article. Nellie loves her, or at least her pen name. Molly and Archie break into McMorning's abandoned lab. It's full of creations locked in cages, and Molly starts painting slogans on signs, such as Monsters for McMorning, and Zombies were people too. They then start breaking the creatures out of the cages, and Molly starts giving them all names, as well as handing out the signs and giving them pieces of guild uniforms. She tells the nanny they used to push Philip's pram to lead the parade into the quarantine zone, and as they leave, she happens upon a room where two bloated gremlins are hanging partially suspended in the air. She opens the door and decides to call them Toot and Poot, and then they head for the enclave. They watch the guild enclave from across the street and see a group of death marshals heading out. Molly considers that they took the bait and heads to the address the guard had given her. It's a plain and nondescript building, but has a guard outside. So they approach, and the man looks at them and then tries to rush inside. Archie grabs him, and Molly asks if he has any pets or family. The man doesn't answer, so she tries to offer him some of Archie's ice cream. He says no, and Molly remarks that he can talk and asks what he can tell her about this place. The man shakes his head, so she asks if there are death marshals inside or if they've all gone to the parade. He tells them that they're undead scum, and Molly's offended, so Archie picks the man up and starts shaking him violently. Molly yells at him, so he puts the man back down, and tries to pat him on the head, but instead breaks his nose. The man screams out, and Molly tells him that she can fix it, but the man pulls away. She asks if he's going to help now, and when he says no, Archie growls and leans towards him, so the man changes his mind. She leans down and reaches for his nose, and with a crunch, she realigns it as the man howls. She declares that it's fixed, and tells him that it's his turn now. The man starts babbling, telling her everything she wants, including how many guards were inside, and the layout of the building. She thanks him, and Archie pats him on the back, but the force slams him on the ground and knocks him out. Molly says luck isn't on everyone's side, and comments that if they ever see him as one of McMorning's creations, she shall call him Fritz. She whistles, and a rogue necromancy approaches. She tells Buttercup to break down the door, and the monster charges. As the door smashes open, a guard sergeant looks at them surprised. He goes for his gun, and Molly asks if he would go on the record about the treatment of prisoners at this facility. As the man hesitates, Buttercup pounces on him. 
Once the man is dead, Molly gives the necromancy some scratches, and then they head deeper inside the building. They come upon a room full of guards, all standing ready to defend themselves. She pokes one of the gassers, and a noxious gas fills the room. It incapacitates many of the guards, and Buttercup takes care of the rest. In another room, an investigator asks Philip what he remembers of his life before death. He tells her about how eating was better back when he had a stomach. He makes up some stories, and the investigator takes notes. And when he mentions Kythera, she gets particularly interested, thinking she might finally get some useful information out of him. He keeps babbling on, but then stops to listen to something. The investigator asks him about the Gorgon's tear, and he tells her it's in Seamus's head. She is surprised, and he makes jokes about how there's plenty of room up there. She thanks him for his help, and he says no problem. He likes to be of service, especially since this is his last day here. Molly and Archie make their way into a room and start to hear a voice. Only Philip could drone on like that, so Archie breaks down the door and Molly says hi. The investigator drops her notebook and Philip tells her that he told her so. As the woman tries to flee, Archie squishes her and then Molly takes the notebook and retrieves Philip telling him she missed him. He comments that they actually listened to him here. On their way out, he asks about the parade he heard the guild talking about and asks if it was her doing. She says yes, and he says having a parade for him was the kindest thing she's ever done. Molly explains that the parade was not for him, but for McMorning, and he demands to know why. She explains that the whole guild is after him, and that she needed a distraction, plus the guild were already holding Philip. He says that's not good enough, and he wasn't in any danger. She asks if he didn't miss her, and tells him that she made him a hat. He says no to the hat, and then insists that it wasn't so bad with them, as some of them were good conversationalists. Molly tells him that Archie will be a good listener. Archie then smiles at her, and she says yes, they can go get ice cream on the way home. Philip asks if he can have some too, and Molly agrees, so he says that he may forgive her. Everyone needs a friend, and Molly finds it disheartening that many people see her friends as monsters. They may look hideous on the outside, but what really counted was on the inside. Her followers were gentle, but unfortunately, no one bothered to get to know them. She seemed to have a comforting effect on the undead, and anyone who tries to stop her from liberating them from laboratories get turned into a fine paste. These monsters protect her no matter what, and when any of them wander off, she uses the buddy system to make sure that they stay safe. And that's everything on Molly so far. She's a bit of a weird one. She's been around since first edition, so she has a ton of lore, but a lot of it she was just sort of present for. It wasn't really until second edition that she really became her own character. It's interesting that she seems to have a relationship with a lot of the other resurrectionists, which isn't true for some of them. And even though she hates Seamus, I wonder if that's gonna have something to do with where the story for the Resurs goes in the future. I also think it would've been cool if Molly and Reva had met before the Burning Man showed up, because it seems like they would've had a lot in common. But anyway, let me know in the comments which of Molly's stories is your favorite. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, check out the Discord and Patreon. On that note, huge shout out to the extremely cool kids on Patreon, Steam Powered Scoundrels, and Dogmatize, and thanks for watching.